Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Peter Hunt, Principal Research Scientist for CSIRO's Animal Health Team based out of Armidale. Peter has been the Chief Researcher and Project Leader, and he will present and discuss the project, which has worked to test whole farm system changes to land production in the summer rainfall zone by comparing autumn versus winter spring lambing and incorporating dual purpose crops into the grazing system. The project being discussed here is one of several investments made through the Livestock Productivity Partnership, which is a five year collaboration running from 2017 to 2022 between the MLA donor company, University of New England, CSIRO, New South Wales DPI, and more recently, University of Tasmania and the University of Melbourne. The LPP investments also form part of a larger national initiative to improve feed based resilience and year round feed supply and overall better animal nutrition. I'm going to hand over to Peter and if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A chat, which we'll pick up after the presentation. Thank you, Peter, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, next slide, please. OK, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Camilleroy people as the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting from today and the Anawan traditional owners of the land on which we conducted our field trial, which I'll be describing and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about when is the best time to land, um, considering feed based and animal health. It's um, I guess some some thoughts and, and outcomes of our research uh, recently. Next slide, please, Emma. So there's a team of people that, that have done this work, uh, quite a, a large number of us at CSIRO, uh, including Bob Dobson, who was um, the instigator of one of the models I'll describe uh, and has, has retired, but we're honouring him here. Uh, Brian Horton from the University of Tasmania and uh, our, our friends from the LPP that Emma's described, uh, Warwick, Suze and Tom, and our friends at MLA, um, Cam, Alan and Emma. Next slide, please. So I'm going to cover six areas. So the reasons behind our research, uh, autumn lambing and seasonal estrus, trial design, weather and pasture performance, animal health modelling and our trial outcomes, animal health performance in the trial, and the financial outcomes from modelling and the trial. Next slide, please. So a major reason behind our research is about how we can continue into the future controlling parasitic diseases of livestock. So here on this timeline, I've put the two most recent actives for controlling uh, gastrointestinal parasites in, in sheep, also blowfly strike in sheep, ticks in cattle and flukes, which infect both sheep and cattle. You can see that it's been quite some years since the last released product there for uh, worm control in sheep, yet we have resistance already against those uh, last two compounds as well as all the previous ones before that. For blowfly strike, we have resistance against most of those. So the message is that resistance comes along. Next slide, please, Emma. So why is it that products take a while to reach market? Well, it's actually quite hard to discover new actives and the companies aren't sitting on their hands. They're trying to do it, but they not only have to come up with new products, they also have to come up with new products that fit with farm practice and also are affordable. So it's actually quite a, quite a demand. And so with that and resistance and also with market requirements that can limit the use of products, there's quite a quite a crunch point. We call that the agri-pest challenge. Um, it's not the um, only um, issue facing us, but it's one of the big issues facing our industry. So there are four areas of response to this that we've identified. Reduce, that means reducing the use of chemicals so that you get resistance um, slower, we slow down resistance. So measures like integrated pest management are part of that reduce option. 
replace is when we replace chemicals with something else. So for example, we're working on a fly strike vaccine right now for, um, for sheep. Uh, rethink is another idea. So this is where we try to minimize these market requirements by communicating better with our customers and making sure everybody understands uh, that things are safe and, and okay to use. Redesign is what we're talking about today. Next slide, please. So we are interested in changing the um, the enterprise mix on farms, or perhaps um, the timing of operations on farms, that sort of thing to minimize exposure to parasites so that we can more easily control them. Next slide, please, Emma. So this particular project, we asked, can changing lambing time reduce and sheep health costs and slow the development of resistance. So the proposal was to change from spring to autumn lambing and uh, produce lambs that mature before the summer threats like blowfly strike and barber's pole worm are there and therefore um, that they're sold and they're not exposed to those risks. But will we get just as many lambs and will they grow up well and produce a good carcass? They're the questions we had to ask. Next slide, please. So first, a little bit about autumn lambing and seasonal estrus. Next slide, please. So sheep are naturally seasonal breeders. That means that ewes ovulate when day length is getting shorter. So in the autumn and the early winter, the day lengths are getting shorter and ewes will ovulate and when they're mated, will produce lambs in the following spring. If however, next slide please Emma, you want to lamb in autumn, you have to do something to enable you to mate you successfully when day length is increasing. And so a product like this melatonin product is one way to do this. Um, it simply replaces the natural hormone that is present during the autumn with uh, an uh, added one. So it's still the same as the natural hormone, it's just an implant. So if you apply that, then put the rams in, you can mate at an earlier time of the year and you can have lambs born in the autumn. Next slide, please. So now I'll go over the trial design, the weather um, and the pasture performance that, that occurred during our, during our field trial. Next slide, please. So firstly, we um, we followed the uh, advice for producing autumn lambs. We used the regular program. We also mated these autumn lambing ewes in December. 5th of December was our start date each year. And lambing started from the 1st of May each year. For the spring lambing group, we started um, mating on the 25th of March and they started lambing from the 18th of August. The regular was used only in the autumn use. Next slide please. So this has been a very bizarre run of years. So this is a graph of soil moisture content at 300 millimetres over time for the entire project period. So you can see this very dramatic dry period at the beginning, that was our 2019 drought, which was very severe. You can see the following years almost severely, but in the other, other end of the scale, severely wet. So each of these bars shows you the beginning of mating through to the sale and slaughter of those lambs from that mating. So you can see there are overlapping production cycles for both the autumns in the orange and the spring uh, production system in pink. Next slide, please. So another feature of the string of seasons is what happened to soil temperatures. So see especially the um, the peak of, of summer soil temperature in the second two years compared to the first two, and it's much lower. It's five degrees lower. And so this is limited pasture growth during this trial period as well. So that's something else to consider. Next slide, please. So this is some pictures of our trial, um, trial site. So the first on the left in July 2019 in the middle of the drought, 
you can see there quite clearly that just about everything's dead except for these dual purpose crops which we planted we planted them in april they came on the back of a very small amount of rainfall and it's quite impressive how much um, pasture there was there from those crops during july that year on the right is a picture from january this year you can see that the situation is very much different in fact the white there is all surface water reflecting um, the light back to the satellite so very very different times in the trial we had eight uh, farmlets and each of those farmlets had eight subplots so i've labeled them there a through to h and in each of these farmlets were 20 ewes and they had their lambs and they did all the grazing and, and production within that farmlet so there was a, um, a stocking rate of about 10 dse per hectare in this uh, in this system so next slide please half of the plots um, had used that land in the autumn so i've marked them there with the orange bars again and the other half had spring lambing use and they're in the pink so we, we did alternate farmlets like that up the field um, and of course the dual purpose crops were there in a and p and e and f so one each of the oh, sorry two each of the autumns and two each of the uh, springs next slide please so over the whole experiment um, we measured about a hundred um, feed events of, or grazing events for each of the four groups and so uh, 400 and something in total and we decided to um, assess these about against the feed demand that was present at the time that we we did those feeding events and divide them into deficits and surpluses now we've been pretty generous to the sheep in this so the deficits aren't always that severe um, but but still we needed a way of dividing them up so you can see here quite clearly that there were more um, grazing events in surplus than deficit overall but you can also see that the spring systems had more um, surplus relative to deficit compared to the autumn you can also see that the provision of dual purpose crops which is something we did in the uh, one of the two autumn groups and, and one of the two um, spring groups had not much of an advantage at all in autumn and, and really had um, not much of a change or either for, for the um, spring so that's what happened there next slide please So now I'm going to talk about the animal health modeling and trial outcomes. Next slide, please. So first as a bit of an indication of U health, here's some information about lambing. So we had um, divided our, our ewes after each lambing period into these categories. So they, they may have been dry, they may have lambed but lost their lambs, they may have lambed twins or triplets, but, but still raised one. That's the LAL star category. They may have had a single and raised that or twins and raised those. So you can see there the autumn uh, ewes produced um, more twins than the spring ewes, uh, but less singles. And they had more of these uh, events where twins were born, but only one was raised. Also, there were far fewer dry use in the autumn group compared to the spring group so there's no real evidence there that autumn was unfavorable for this reproduction next slide please when it comes to parasite infections so we did some modeling with robert dobson's model and this is the predicted loss of meat production caused by parasites at different stocking rates so there's different stocking rates in those different colors you can see with the autumn system we predict that those would be far lower than in the spring system now we couldn't actually measure that effect directly in our field trial so next slide please so what we did is we followed the worm boss regulations for drenching so we did regular flock monitors on our lambs and then we drenched them when they exceeded thresholds as as directed by worm boss 
And then we counted up how many drenches the different groups had over time. So you can see there in the graph that in year one, the autumn lambs were not drenched. In contrast, the spring lambs got three drenches that year. In the second year, one of the four groups of autumn lambs got a drench, so that's why it looks like a quarter there. Um, and the spring lambs got between two and three drenches each group. In the third year, so the harshest year as far as parasite burden is concerned, the autumn lambs got between two and three trenches and the spring lambs got between four and five. So this is pretty clearly demonstrating that the autumn lambing did reduce um, intestinal parasite load in these sheep. Next slide, please. However, when you look at the ewes, which are in the system the whole year, there is no difference at all. And that was what we expected as well. So there's no advantage of time of lambing for parasite burden in ewes. They're in the system the whole year round, whether they lamb in autumn or in spring. Next slide, please. So let's have a look now at fly strike. So Brian's um, model um, can help us uh, estimate the number of sheep at risk of fly strike over time. And the way he does it is with um, two colours. So the blue there are all the sheep at risk if you didn't have a preventative treatment. And the red is when, when you have applied some chemical to, to try and avoid fly strike. So you can see there again, quite clearly, there's a prediction that spring lambs will be far more exposed to fly strike compared to autumn lambs. Next slide, please. However, when we, when we looked at our data and the number of animals treated, ewes in the top graph and the lambs in the bottom graph, there are actually no differences statistically between the groups. So in year one, uh, we used icyclinol to prevent fly strike. In year two, we didn't use anything. This was partially because we'd found dicyclinol resistance and we hadn't developed a system yet to uh, replace the dicyclinol. In year three, we used cyromazine. We also shore the, the lambs that year. That's the only year we shore the lambs and that was all about avoiding fly strike. We knew it was going to be a bad year. Um, many producers would have experienced that this year, this last summer. So um, unfortunately, there was no advantage there for fly strike. Next slide, please. So thinking now about how the animals performed production wise in the trial. Next slide, please. So first, uh, another look at lambing. So you can see on the left, the green and blue bars, the total number of lambs produced was greater in the autumn. Uh, also, you can see that the hashed bars, the lambs that died, they're also greater. So although we got more lambs alive from autumn, we also had more lambs dead. So there's some, perhaps some untapped potential there. Next slide, please. Another way of looking at it is, how did the ewes perform at lambing? So I've divided the ewes here into ewes that had three or more lambs over the period. That means they had at least one a year. Some had uh, five or six lambs over the period, or they had less than three lambs. So there, there was at least one year where they had no lambs. No lambs raised, that is. So you can see there that the autumn in total exceeds the spring um, for the, the category on the right, three or more lambs. And also you can see that there's a standout group, which is the spring lambing system with the dual purpose crops supplied. We do not understand this at all, but they had a lower number of ewes who produced three or more lambs compared to the other groups. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through lamb growth rates one year at a time. And the reason for that is that we had very different outcomes for our dual purpose crop operation in these three different years. So in the first year, cycle one, we had to finish all of our lambs on grain. There simply wasn't enough pasture despite the, the presence of those dual purpose crops to finish those lambs. So we're comparing grain finishing here. The difference with the blue bar 
is because these lambs were grazed on the dual purpose crops before they went on grain. And that appears to have given them quite an advantage in this system. The, um, the lambs in the, the black group there, their ewes with the lambs at foot did graze the dual purpose crops, but that didn't seem to give them much of an advantage um, at all. Next slide, please. So the second year was quite different. We successfully sowed the dual purpose crops again. Uh, there was plentiful pasture and no, no grain was required. Again, the autumn lambs grew faster. The pasture lambs, though, were the, the standout ones in this year. The spring lambs grew slightly slower. Um, next slide, please. In the third year, we had that very, very wet summer and autumn, and we were actually unable to get equipment on the paddock to sow the dual purpose crops at all. So in this year, really everything finished on pasture. And you can see there quite nicely, actually, that the difference between dual purpose crops and pastures disappeared. So because it's not there, they're the same. And again, the autumn lambs grew faster than the, uh, the spring ones in that year. Next slide, please. So overall then, to summarise what happened, the total number of lambs slaughtered is greater for autumn than spring, but there is particularly spring with dual purpose crops was, was a low performer in our experiment. When you look at carcass weights though, there is very little difference between autumn and spring. <laughs> but there was um, an advantage for the dual purpose crop um, groups overall. So this is including the year where there weren't dual purpose crops. Next slide, please, Emma. So let's now look at the, the financial outcomes from the modeling and the trial. So, thank you. Um, one of the things I've got to mention is that the prices weren't the same. So we had slightly higher prices for the autumn lamb sales every year and the differences were, were bigger in some years than others. They're not huge, but they are, they are there. Um, when we look at the value of the carcass, so this includes the carcass weight and the price, of course, it really, the, the comparison really just compares, um, well, it's, it's in line with the carcass weight data that I showed before. So, uh, there is a slight advantage of autumn uh, autumn value of carcasses about three dollars higher, uh, but there is a bigger advantage of dual purpose crop system lambs. They were worth about five dollars more. So next slide, please. When we take the income from lamb and the income from wool together, we can graph the income received from these systems over the three years. So I've graphed them all there. You can see the pasture ones on the left, the spring born lambs on the right, the dual purpose crop ones at the top and the pasture only ones at the bottom. You can see that we got more income in total each year. That was mostly because of the increasing wool price um, because actually the lamb price was highest in the first year. Expenses, so the red line shows the expenses incurred to produce these sheep in each year. So you can see the first year, everything ran at a loss quite clearly. That was because of supplementary feed during the drought. The second year had the lowest expenditure and the third year had a slightly higher expenditure. In all cases, the expenses for autumn lambing are slightly more than for spring. Um, and the income from autumn lambing is slightly more than spring. Yeah, oh, sorry, that's wrong, except in the cent middle year when it was the other way around. Next slide, please. So when we average across uh, all the years, the gross margin or the net income per hectare um, is, is given there in, in the middle column, trial gross margin. We've also put there the model gross margin. So this is from the models we ran before we did the trial, which um, are quite different numbers, but these used long term averages of wool and uh, lamb income. They also didn't model 
um, super fine wool merinos, which we use, they, they model a different uh, coarser wool, so it wasn't as valuable as well. So I think the rankings are what we should compare here. So the ranking for the model was that dual purpose crop systems with autumn lambing would rank first, dual purpose crop systems with pasture, uh, sorry, dual purpose crop systems with spring lambing second, um, autumn lambing on pasture only third and, and spring lambing on pasture only fourth. When we look at the, what happened in the field trial, so the idea of the field trial was to demonstrate how real life relates to the model. So we can see that the first two are ranked exactly the same. So we got the most income from the dual purpose crop system on pasture, the second most income from that system uh, in the spring. And then the, the, the second two are ranked differently. So we had a higher income from pasture only in spring than from pasture only in autumn. Now I hesitated to put this in, but I think we have to for honesty's sake. So when you include the expenditure and the income from the crops, remembering we only had a crop income for one of the three years, we actually uh, changed those rankings entirely. So the dual purpose crop system incurred more costs um, than, than, than was worth it really. But note that this is with contract labor. This is not a farmer doing it for themselves. So we, we do have to, to take that, that outcome with a bit of a grain of salt. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of analysis here of some of the expenditure categories and what happened over time. So the supplementary feed, obviously there was far more spent in year one than the other two years. But if you look carefully, you can see there that there is a little bit more spent on the autumn systems in each year compared to the spring, even though it's not much in year two and then not much more really in year three. When we look at animal health expenditure, it's uh, the opposite story really. So we had a significant advantage of autumn lambing over spring lambing in, in all three years. And that's mostly about those differences in drench treatments that I talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So the other modeling that Lucy has done here is, is looking at four locations across New South Wales, two of them tablelands locations, so Armidale and Goulburn, and two of them slopes and plains locations, Galagambone and Tamora. When we look at the outcomes there, we can see that this dual purpose crop system with autumn lambing performed best in the models in Armidale, as we saw before, but also in Goulburn, so both the tablelands um, locations. However, it's only the second best for the slopes and plains locations there. So the models predict that spring lambing with um, dual purpose crops would be the better outcome for uh, those locations, for the slopes and plains locations that are listed there. In all cases, the pasture systems didn't perform as well as the dual purpose crop systems in these model outcomes. So that's something to weigh up against the advantages for animal health that autumn lambing might give. Next slide, please, Emma. So some concluding remarks for the work, where we think we're at, where we think we should go next. Next slide, please. So first of all, conclusions, things we observed that we did expect to see. So we did see that dual purpose crops can be useful at filling feed gaps. We did see that they're useful in the modeling in both tablelands and the slopes districts. Uh, we also could see quite clearly from our field work that when sowing is delayed, less feed is available for grazing. And so the advantage of dual purpose crops is less. And sowing was delayed every single year. The first year because of dry, the second year because of um, it was too wet. And the third year we failed to sow it altogether because it was too wet. So when considering this sort of system, I think summer rainfall is a bit of a tough, a tough um, situation. So is dual purpose crops the best way to fill these winter feed gaps? That's something to think about. Autumn lambing. 
So we did confirm that it can result in decreased reliance on drenches for the lambs. Uh, we did see that where lambs grew faster, those, those advantages were more. Um, the lamb birth weights are lower. That's a known thing for autumn lambing and so mortalities are higher as well. We did see, as expected, that there's a cost for ad adding that melatonin implant. So that's about $11 a year. And we did see that autumn lambing resulted in more frequent fee gaps. And so that was also expected. Next slide, please. But there's a few things we didn't expect to see at all, which we did. So this issue of the contract labour is one of those. Um, the grain enterprise was, was very costly uh, in our hands in, in a field evaluation. And that wasn't the case at all in the models. Um, we saw an amazing ability, especially for the canola, of dual purpose crops to provide feed in drought, even though they didn't provide enough to save enough grain to, um, to you know, bring the budget into black. It was still very impressive. We, we grazed the canola in its vegetative state, um, the autumn lambs and the, and the spring ewes. Then we grazed it again just before Christmas. It was sort of a sacrificial grazing event and it was still dry then. The, the, the drought hadn't broken. Then it rained in January and it came up again and we could have fed it out again. We didn't because we had to get on with sowing the crop for the next year. So, so that was pretty impressive. Um, also in spring, these dual purpose crops were associated with having less lambs and we've got no idea why that would happen. Autumn lambing. So it's likely that the benefits are greater financially in tablelands locations. That's not something we expected. Um, they can actually be more profitable than spring systems. We really didn't think that. We thought it would be about the same if we managed pasture properly, but they actually can be more. And yes, disappointingly, I guess, they didn't give a significant advantage for fly strike. But one thing to remember there is the modeling was all done on merino lambs. That's the only, uh, class of sheep for which there's sufficient data to, to run Brian's model. And we had first cross um, lambs here, so they didn't get much fly strike anyway. Other observations which I think are important. The models can't really handle this situation which many farmers are probably familiar with where wet summer conditions slow lamb growth rates right down, even though feed's plentiful. So that's something that happens in real life, but not in, not in the models we used. The other thing is that feed, although feed gaps were more common in the winter time, we experienced feed gaps in every month when you looked across all those grazing events across the three years. So it's a lot more unpredictable um, than perhaps we expected. Next slide, please. So there's a lot we could say about this work and a lot of things that we could do in, in following up from it. But I'll just point out two things. First one is about feed base. So climate change and other forces really mean a reevaluation of feed base options is probably already happening in many farms and is, is needed. Uh, although it's quite complex, it's also something that's probably better off done by producers at the local level. So our program, our, our Livestock Productivity Partnership Program is going to produce lots more options for um, for grazing and pastures and fodder provision. Uh, there's going to be some uh, new varieties of pastures, new brassicas for uh, fodder production, new ways of managing white clover, uh, the possibility of perennial wheat and some new ways of sowing and, and, and establishing pastures that they're working on in Tassie. But all those things are great, but I think we need a local solution for which ones of those are most suited to particular locations. So I'd encourage all producers to think about that and, and how they can maximise their feed base. Because, yeah, solutions are unlikely to work equally well in all situations. And we've demonstrated this with the dual purpose crops here in this study. The second thing is about the advantages and disadvantages of autumn lambing. So some of these things uh, I guess kind of incomplete. So an open question is what advantage, if any, might there be for autumn born replacement ewes, whether they're merinos, first cross or other breeds? We didn't keep any of the lambs, they all went to slaughter. But 
if we need to breed replacement ewes, they'll be bigger and stronger when the summer comes along. Will there be an advantage for them over their springborn counterparts who are a lot smaller and, and perhaps just weaned when, when these stresses of fly strike and, and barber's pole worm come along? Second question there, are there some practical strategies for improving the survival rate of autumn lambs to gain even more production advantage? You'll remember from the slide that the number of lambs that died plus the number of lambs that lived was quite a large number compared to the spring. If we could get more of those lambs to live, um, we, we'd have even more advantage there. Thirdly, we've done this for three years. The advantages in drenches were very, very clear but I'd really like to see that demonstrated over a much longer term to really understand uh, how much of a benefit that is and over more locations as well. So I think it's really, really important given the impending crunch, the impending agri-pest challenge that we've got, that we're facing at the moment. If we can't control worms, we're going to have to use everything else that our, um, everything else we have to try and, and fight worms. And so this is one of the things that can be done. So let's really try and understand how useful it is and where. Um, that's the end of the talk. Um, thanks very much for listening. And I'll hand over to Emma for a second. Thanks, Peter, for that. That's uh, very informative. Um, actually, I've just had a look. There's no uh, questions in the chat, but I did have one for you, Peter. Uh, what's the available support for producers who want to give this uh, a go, the autumn lambing? So the um, th there's a lot of support if they want to use that regular product from the company that produce it. So that's one source of, of support. Uh, I would definitely reach out to other producers who already do autumn lambing. It's not like it's um, an unheard of thing to do. It, 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 there will be people around that you can reach out to. And I really encourage people to talk to local producers who uh, are nearby who are doing autumn lambing. That's really going to be of benefit. And also, I, I think if there are animal health consultants or perhaps agronomists, that you can talk to, I would take advantage of that as well. Although, you know, you can make a profit out of autumn lambing, I'm pretty sure of that, um, it's wise to go into it with your eyes open. Excellent, thank you. Uh, looks like there is a link for a survey in the chat, um, which is available to everybody. And uh, so please, if you joined tonight and we'd love some feedback, Peter would love it and so would we. Um, so unless there's any questions, which I can't see at the moment, Peter, so you're off the hook there. <laughs> That's it for us. Thank you guys for attending. And this will be uh, sent out as a recording if you'd like to watch back or send it around to your networks. Uh, and Peter's available for any follow ups. Got anything else, Peter? No, thanks very much for attending, everybody. All right, great. Thank you, guys.